All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so welcome to this uh, tutorial on graph neural networks uh, for natural language processing. Uh, so I'm Partha Talukdar from uh, the Indian Institute of Science and also Kinom. And uh, my co-presenters are uh, Shikhar and Naganan, uh, who are from uh, the Indian Institute of Science. Um, yeah, there is a little bit of echo from the other room. Okay, so um, here is the tutorial homepage. Uh, so uh, this is a GitHub page uh, where we have uploaded some sample code uh, for the tutorial. And the slides are also available there. And that URL will be present in um, all of the slides as well, so in case you want to download at any point. So uh, let's get started. Uh, so we'll have also a break around 3.30. And, uh, and maybe we'll uh, have some Q&A sessions uh, towards the end of each section. So unless there is a very pressing uh, question, maybe you can just hold on to uh, that end of that session and you can ask your questions. Okay, um, so as the title suggests, so the, this tutorial is about uh, neural networks and graphs. And so uh, let's kind of like you know, unpack that in parts. So one is uh, that like, you know, graphs are everywhere in NLP. Uh, that probably uh, is very uh, familiar to you. So right from some sort of like a constituent uh, power structure, like in this case here, where you have uh, like you know, the sentence and then uh, the non-terminals and the parse tree uh, in the form of a tree here, all right? Uh, similarly, you also have uh, dependency parses uh, where you uh, don't have the non-terminals now, uh, but you have the sentence and, uh, and the pairwise dependencies among the different words. For example, for the verb, uh, what is the subject, what is the direct object, and things like that. Uh, now then you also have this uh, semantic role labeling output, which you can also think in the form of a graph. Uh, where you have these predicate argument uh, structures uh, represented in the form of a graph. For example, if you have the sentence, uh, John hit the ball, uh, then uh, you can uh, have uh, like you know, John as a node, hit as a node, and the ball as uh, separate nodes. And then you have this uh, predicate uh, where hit is the predicate and the argument relationships between them. Right? So in all of these cases, the graph is defined at a sentence level where the nodes are basically tokens or uh, phrases of the sentence and the uh, edges are various dependencies among them. Uh, but uh, we could also have graphs in NLP which goes beyond sentences. For example, if you have a, for coreference resolution, uh, of course you could have coreference within the sentence, but you could also have across sentences. For example, in this case, uh, if you have the sentences, the ball was hit by John, uh, it was made out of rubber, we know that it is actually referring to the ball and not John, right? So again, we could have nodes. Uh, the word says nodes in this graph or phrases as nodes in the graph and the co-references uh, among them uh, could be the edges. Now this is uh, the, uh, the first three graphs were at a sentence level. Then uh, we have the co-reference graph at a document level. But we could also have now going beyond also at the corpus level. So like you know, graphs of the form, say, knowledge graphs, uh, which are these entity relationship graphs where nodes will represent objects of interest and the edges are the relationships uh, that connects those entities. For example, uh, uh, Asia World Expo uh, Center will be a node, Hong Kong will be another node, and Asia World Expo is located in, right? So that will be the relationship connecting those two entities. So these are just various forms of graphs uh, defined at different granularities, right? From sentence uh, to document to corpus level. But also graphs have been uh, extensively used in NLP and that probably is again very familiar to most of us. I'll just give you two examples of those. For example, in the case of uh, relationship extraction, uh, given two noun phrases or entities, you want to uh, decide what type of relationships exist between those two noun phrases or entities in a given sentence. Uh, so way back in, uh, in this uh, work from 2005, uh, uh, Bunescu and Muni showed that like, you know, if you actually derive features from the dependency part, the shortest path, uh, uh, de dependency uh, 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 path that connects those two noun phrases, those could be very useful in uh, making these kind of predictions whether a particular person is there at a particular location or not. So that's one instance of relationship extraction. Then again, in uh, syntax-based machine translation, 
uh, you basically do the whole translation uh, process uh, in the form of by like, you know, uh, 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 transforming trees and doing these translations finally at the token level. So where all of the processing itself is uh, happening over graphs, right? So now in this case, in the first case, we derive just features from the graph, from the dependency graph. In the second case, we define the whole translation operation itself uh, over the syntactic tree. But then there are like you know, many, many, many such uh, examples. But in all of these cases, uh, like you know, we utilize graphs either to predict or to derive features from uh, in the pre-deep stage, right? But now, of course, uh, deep learning models are all over NLP, and just two classes of them are these, like you know, which are very popular and where it's been very effective. Uh, these recurrent neural networks, like you know, RNNs, uh, GRUs, LSTMs, and of course, of late, uh, like you know, transformers are all the rage. So one question is, uh, like you know, in these kind of models, how to incorporate graph structure, right? Like we had seen in this kind of like you know, pre-deep examples uh, uh, that we presented before. So this tutorial is primarily focused on how we can uh, work with these kind of like you know, graph structures uh, in these kind of like you know, deep learning models within NLP. So one question you could ask is like, you know, why we should care about graphs and uh, their importance in, uh, at least for deep learning uh, for NLP. So I just want to motivate that through two uh, recent uh, successes of doing that. Uh, so one is uh, in this uh, paper by Anervas et al, uh, which came out in NACL 2018. Uh, so, uh, so for example, in this document classification task on the 20 news groups data set, uh, they were able to show that uh, rather than just uh, deriving signals from the training data itself, which is the document classification problem, uh, if you augment that and uh, like, you know, get some feature representation also from an associated knowledge graph, uh, then you are able to make that prediction problem better. Right? So, uh, the, so they, for their base classification, uh, they used an LSTM-based model, which is given by this uh, red curve here. On the x-axis, you see the fraction of uh, training data that's being used, so increasingly more amounts of training data. And the y-axis is the accuracy, so higher is better. So of course, as you'd expect, like, as you get more training data, you're able to improve on performance. Uh, then on the, the blue line here is uh, LSTM. Uh, model again, when it's trained on 100% of the training data, various fractions of that 100% of the training data, right? So this fraction is defined either at the 70% of the mark or the 100% of the training data. Uh, so of course, when you also have more amounts of training data, you do better. But what's interesting is when you augment this LSTM uh, with features from a knowledge graph, uh, which is what is represented by this KG, you're actually be able to better uh, do better than both of these two models at all uh, like you not know, the uh, all amounts of supervision, but what's also interesting is this uh, LSTM augmented model with just 70% of the data is not only able to do better than that this pure deep learned model uh, at 70%, but it's also able to do better with this 100% of the training model, and it's, that's especially uh, more pronounced in case of the lower training regimes. So that's that's interesting. That shows that like you know with addition of this external knowledge represented in the form of a graph, you're able to uh, improve performance of a deep learning model. Uh, similar trends here uh, for the natural language uh, inference task as well. But just to point uh, here is that even though the trends are, trends are the same, uh, the colors uh, between these two are kind of like flipped. But the message that I mentioned before is, uh, is true. Similarly, in this, uh, uh, Vashis et al.'s work from ACL 2019, uh, they were able to show that, uh, so this is focused on improving word uh, embeddings. So if you basically uh, augment the word embedding models uh, with external uh, information, for example, different semantic relationships that exist among the words, say synonymy, antonymy, uh, or like you know, other types of say uh, more complex relationships, uh, like you know whether uh, then they are also able to show that you actually learn a better uh, word embedding, which in turn helps you do better in some downstream tasks. Right, and then there are increasingly more evidence of this kind which says that like, you know, if you are able to handle these kind of uh, deep learning models in conjunction with the graphs uh, in, uh, in some sort of principled way, uh, then there are uh, like, you know, improvements to be had at the end of the day. So that's about the motivation. Hopefully you are convinced and we'll of course go through a lot more applications uh, later on. Uh, so 
those of you who are familiar with uh, graph-based semi-supervised learning, which is also called as the label propagation, uh, has some uh, that you can think of as like you know, the previous iterations of what we are going to talk about, but of course in the non-neural, non-deep uh, learned way. So the uh, graph-based semi-supervised learning problem uh, is that given a graph of this kind, uh, where you have the nodes and the edges represent uh, basically similarity among the nodes, and the uh, edge weight represents the degree of similarity, and then you have some supervision information on some subset of the nodes. So in this particular case, I know that Microsoft is a company and Bangalore is also, Bangalore is a city, so I have provided the initial graph structure with this edge similarity information and this seed information, right? So now the task of graph-based SSL is how we can classify the rest of the nodes in this graph by utilizing this graph structure and this initial seed information. Right? Uh, so that's basically the problem of graph SSL, and there have been many methods that have been proposed. So in uh, ACL 2012, uh, we presented a tutorial on this particular problem, uh, uh, where you basically pose this as a convex optimization problem, and then you go on to solve this. Right? Uh, and uh, subsequently, we also uh, 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 documented all of these things in the form of this uh, a Morgan Claypool book on graph-based semi-supervised learning. So one question is like, you know, whatever these graph neural network methods that we are talking about, what is its relationships with these graph SSL methods? By the way, it's also called label propagation because uh, like, you know, the, the, the algorithms for graph SSL tend to have this kind of like propagation of labels over the graph. Uh, and that's why they are called uh, LP or Lobel propagation as well. So uh, the question is, uh, how are these graph neural networks that we are going to discuss today are different from uh, these graph SSL methods? So one uh, big difference is that in case of graph SSL or these label propagation methods, uh, directly from the structure and that initial seed information that you have, you are estimating the labels on the initially unlabeled nodes directly. Right? But in case of graph neural networks, we are actually going to uh, learn embeddings uh, for nodes in the graph. So that we are going to change the representations that are present in my nodes, which uh, would not have happened in case of the uh, graph SSL or the LP methods, right? And uh, even though I have shown here uh, these revised embeddings or representations at the node level, but some of the methods that we are going to discuss today are also uh, able, capable of learning embeddings not just at the node level, but also at the subgraph and the whole graph level. Right? So that's one big difference. So there is change in representations that's involved in the graph neural networks. The other uh, point is that in case of the regular graph SSL methods, uh, they were primarily capable of handling only one type of relationship, which is similarity, right? So that this node is similar to this other node with the edge weight representing the degree of similarity. But in case of graph neural networks, uh, we'll be able to put many different types of edges uh, and uh, you know, many different types of nodes and edges in the graph. So that's also one big difference. And without having to explicitly uh, model uh, each one of those separate relationships uh, uh, individually. Right? Uh, uh, in case of the graph SSL methods, uh, the graph structure was basically utilized as a regularizer in the objective, uh, but in case of the graph neural networks, that will be handled in a more implicit manner uh, inside the models, and this point will become clear uh, later on in the presentation. And also we find that in practice, uh, graph neural networks tend to be more effective. So uh, in, in this uh, few uh, downstream tasks, uh, like you know, people have shown before, uh, that like, you know, learning these representations and then from there uh, making the predictions is better than say just uh, doing the predictions over the graph itself. So uh, this is in short uh, a motivation for uh, why we should care about graph neural networks and their relevance for uh, NLP and their relevance uh, to these uh, previous uh, 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 semi-supervised learning based methods uh, for uh, graph, uh, in, in case of the graph based methods. Right? So that completes the initial introduction and uh, uh, motivation part. Uh, next, uh, Shikhar is going to take over and walk, you, walk us through a variety of methods uh, in case of graph neural networks, how we can also implement them uh, effectively. And then Naganan uh, is going to uh, present a variety of uh, applications of these uh, graph neural networks uh, uh, 
uh, and uh, for both NLP and the NLP and vision intersection. And then finally, we are going to close off uh, the uh, tutorial uh, with some open problems and conclusions, right? And we'll probably take a break after the uh, implementing GCN part. Uh, so over to Shikhar now, but before handing over, do you have any questions about the introduction and the motivation uh, why we should say care about graph neural networks for NLP? No? Okay, so over to Shikhar. So good afternoon everyone. So uh, I'll be covering the uh, main part of the tutorial which is about methods. Uh, so I'll be starting with the overview of GNNs. Uh, then we'll go into uh, different subsections of this particular topic. Uh, so this will be the uh, whole pipeline. Uh, so we'll start with the overview of GNNs and uh, then we will uh, talk about some neighborhood aggregation schemes that exist in GNNs. Uh, and then uh, we'll see like how GNNs can be used for unsupervised uh, learning, like uh, if the labels are not available, then also uh, uh, GNNs can be applied. <clears throat> then we'll talk about graph pooling and uh, some theory behind GNNs, like how we get these equations uh, which we use. Uh, so yeah, let's start with the overview of GNNs. Uh, so I'll be covering uh, what are the like limitations of CNN models and uh, we'll like uh, briefly uh, present to you like what is the actual GNN formulation and uh, how is it trained in NLP uh, models. So, uh, so we are we are all familiar with convolutional neural networks. So, like if you look at the uh, like performance of CNNs, then it has a big impact on both like vision and NLP community. So, uh, so on, in image recognition, uh, c using CNNs, people have uh, cross human level performance, and uh, the same goes with uh, speech recognition as well. So, the main reason behind uh, the performance of CNN is that uh, uh, they have like three key properties. The first is the uh, translation. So even if you translate the image uh, with some distance, uh, then also the features almost remains the same. So that is uh, one of the key property. Uh, the second property is that uh, it uh, uses this, it looks at the localized, localized uh, space in the whole image. It doesn't look at the whole image at once. It looks at different patches and it extracts features out of it. And uh, multiple layers of CNNs can be put on top of each other. And uh, this can help us learn more high level features. Uh, which are very helpful for downstream applications. So uh, because of these three key properties, CNNs are so effective at solving these problems like image uh, recognition and speech, speech recognition. So now let's talk about how we can uh, apply these CNNs for graph. So, so one can uh, look at it. So CNNs are originally proposed for Euclidean data. Uh, where you, we can perform these kind of operations like translation. So you have an image, you can translate it with A and B like in a, along X or Y axis. But the same uh, doesn't go with graphs. So there is no notion of translation on graphs. So that's why uh, you cannot apply CNNs directly on graphs. Moreover, uh, this pooling operation, which is like an integral part of CNNs, uh, it cannot be defined on graph uh, like uh, directly. Like uh, there is no intuitive way like how can you define a pooling operation on graph. But uh, in the Euclidean space, it's very obvious. Like you, you have this window and like you take the maximum element out of it and that gives you the max pooled output. But in graphs, there is no intuitive way. So, uh, so, uh, so I'll be uh, motivating all my uh, like whole talk with this example. So uh, this will be like along with us throughout the tutorial. So, uh, so this is a like co-authorship network. So here like uh, nodes represent authors and the edge represent that two authors have written a paper together. So it's called co-authorship. So uh, the first problem we'll be talking about uh, in this co-authorship is uh, node classification problem. So suppose uh, we know uh, like what is the area of interest of each author. So like Tom uh, works in ML and like Lisa works in physics. So the task here is like uh, we want to predict like what is the area of interest of uh, uh, the unknown authors like Sam and Sally. So that is uh, uh, one problem which uh, which we will solve through GCNs and this is called a semi-supervised setting because uh, some of the subset of labels are, uh, some subset of the nodes are labeled and uh, we have to uh, predict the unlabeled ones. The second problem we'll be focusing on is uh, uh, community detection. So uh, we are given a graph and uh, we have no other information about it, just the uh, edge information and the nodes. So we want to detect communities in the network. So like uh, this can be like uh, an ML community and this can be another community. So we want to do it in an automated manner. So how can we use GCNs for that? The third will be uh, graph classification. So we are given a subset of graph and uh, a subgraph or a whole graph itself and we want to do some sort of classification on it. So this comes in the category of uh, supervised learning. 
so before uh, going into theory like uh, how GNN equation comes and like uh, what is the reasoning behind all that, uh, we will directly present to you the formulation which is uh, used uh, uh, by the community. So basically uh, a, a very high level picture is that you take CNN and you take this graph spectral theory uh, and like a combination of both gives us this equation. So so this is what you will see in most of the papers uh, on GCNs and uh, graph neural networks. So uh, we'll talk about their derivation at the end of this tutorial, uh, like uh, in this in the same section. Uh, so let's first understand what this equation is about. So so this W in this equation represents a filter matrix, just like uh, in CNNs we have this kernel. So here we have this W matrix, which is called filter matrix, and uh, X U represent the node features. So in GNNs we learn a representation for each node. So, uh, so instead of like uh, refining the initial representation as some random vector, we can uh, use these uh, uh, some of the meaningful features as the initial representation. And uh, using GNN, we can learn a more refined uh, representation. So, uh, these initial uh, features can be uh, word to vec embedding. So, like if you are working in NLP domain, and if our nodes are words, then uh, we can represent uh, them initially with word to vec embeddings. Uh, if one doesn't have anything, then one can just use one hot vector. And uh, in case of authors, uh, authorship graph, so we can just look at all the papers of the, uh, what, what the, that author has written, and we can uh, just uh, take the frequent keywords which he uses in his paper. So that can also be one of the initial features to work with. So, uh, so this is the uh, main part of the thing. So, uh, so basically for each node in the graph, uh, we will multiply uh, its neighbors with this filter matrix. So that's what's going on here. So NV represents the neighbors of this node V. So we will look at each neighbor, multiply it with this filter W, and uh, take the sum of it. So this NV also includes the self, self loop. So uh, this V also will come in this summation equation. And once we have this sum, uh, we just perform some normalization, and we also add a bias. So W and B are parameters of the model, and they are trained based on the downstream task. And uh, uh, rest all uh, is like fixed, like XV, uh, XU dep depends on the input. And we also have a non-linearity over here. So uh, people generally use ReLU. So, uh, so that, that forms the complete uh, GNN equation. And this is done for all the vertices in the graph. So uh, once we do it, so we get a updated e uh, equation, which is called as GCN representation for each node. So this is how it is done at each iteration. So you you have some initial representation for each node. You apply this equation, and that gives you a new representation, which is HV for each node in the graph. So and that is your uh, GNN, equation, GNN uh, embedding, and that encodes the graph information in it. Yeah. So uh, so this equation it just captures one hop neighborhood for each node in the graph. But uh, uh, in practice, we want uh, nodes to encode like more hop neighborhood. So suppose if one is interested in capturing k hop neighborhood, then one can just stack k such layers of it. And uh, so just uh, k has got added in the superscript over here. So basically in this, uh, in this scenario, the input, the output of the first layer will become as the input to the second layer. And this is how like we will do it k times. And the final embedding we will use uh, as the final embedding of that particular node. So uh, this will, uh, so using Kalia will allow us to capture K hop neighborhood. So that's the uh, thing here. Yeah, so uh, these are the models which we all are familiar with. So people generally like uh, in NLP applications. So here I'm talking about semantic role labeling. So you have, you are given some sentence, you represent uh, each token in that sentence with some word to vec embedding. And uh, then you apply some by LSTM. And uh, then there is some kind of uh, uh, pooling here and uh, we pass it to a classifier and that does the classification task. So uh, with GCNs, what we can do is uh, we can exploit this uh, graph structure, which is part of, uh, which is part of the input uh, as a, uh, in, in, the, in our architecture in an end-to-end -end fashion. So the parameters of the GCN will be trained based on our final objective. So here uh, we are exploiting syntactic parts of this particular sentence. So this we can obtain through any standard pass like Stanford Core NLP or Aaron NLP. So, uh, so they will give us this kind of graph structure and that we can exploit uh, in an end-to-end -end fashion as a part of our uh, architecture. So, so GCNs, uh, so before GCNs, like, uh, uh, there, is, there was no, uh, no direct way of capturing this graph information uh, within the network. But uh, GCNs are allowing us to capture this uh, graph information uh, while learning. So that's the advantage which GCNs are providing. So any kind of graph structure can be exploited uh, within the, uh, as, a, as a part of the network itself. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk about the next part. So uh, some limitations of the existing GCN schemes. So we looked at this example. So the real world graphs uh, are not homogeneous. So like there can exist nodes like Tom, so which are like uh, highly connected, like they have multiple neighbors, but they can exist like uh, node atoms as well in the same graph, which are like, which have just one connection. So current approaches, uh, like the initial approaches, they uh, give, they handle both the, both the types of node uh, in the similar in a similar fashion, uh, which can lead to some uh, problems, as we can see, like uh, because uh, here, like uh, it needs, uh, like the mo method should uh, handle these two cases a li little bit differently. So, for that, uh, uh, different solutions have been proposed. So, I'll define the problem here more formally. So, the uh, nodes like Tom are called as hub nodes. So, uh, so this is indicated over this box here. So if you just look at like two hop neighborhood of such nodes in uh, like in a big social network or something like that, then uh, within two hop it almost covers the entire graph. But uh, for uh, nodes like Adam, which are leaf nodes, uh, their two hop neighborhood will cover just a small fraction of the graph. So basically uh, uh, what happens is that for hub nodes, this summation becomes very large and the final embedding which we get for that node is almost noisy because if we are summing around like 1000 nodes for a, for getting GCN representation of a particular node then it's almost noisy, like it uh, doesn't carry much meaning. So something needs to be done to control this uh, influence neighborhood. So uh, I'll talk about two proposed solutions for this particular problem. So first is uh, graph attention networks and uh, second I'll talk about the confidence based graph convolution networks. So uh, this graph attention networks, uh, the, it is inspired from transformer model. So uh, basically in transformer, like we have multiple heads and uh, for a given token, we calculate the attention over different other tokens in the sentence. So in the case of a graph, uh, uh, so for a particular node, instead of giving equal importance to all its neighbors, which is there in the standard equation, like there is just uh, standard summation, we will uh, we will also consider uh, importance of, the, of that uh, of, of a neighboring node, and that is computed in this fashion. So it's quite simple. So we have uh, some. Uh, so here, the ith represent uh, the target node, and hj is its neighbor. So what we do is that we multiply it with some um, uh, weight w, uh, both the current node and its neighbor, and concatenate and uh, take the dot product with some a vector. So a and w are parameters over here. Uh, so this way, uh, if we'll do it for all the neighbors, then it gives us some kind of scoring or attention over all the all its neighbors. And this we utilize the part of uh, this equation. So earlier, this alpha ij was not there. So now uh, this has become a part of our equation. And uh, so th instead of keeping just one one w, we they consider k k w's, and each w is basically one head in the network. And uh, the representation obtained from each head is concatenated. Uh, if it is not the final layer, in the final layer they just take the mean over all the heads. So this way, instead of giving equal importance to all the neighbors, we are we are giving uh, importance based on some uh, based on other factors, and this helps to reduce the influence neighborhood. And it has been shown that uh, compared to standard GCN model, it gives uh, considerable improvement uh, on standard benchmark data sets. Uh, so apart from that work. Uh, uh, there has also been uh, uh, work in this AI stretch recently, so which also solves this particular problem. So uh, the work is motivated by this example. So suppose uh, we have this node A, and its actual label is uh, white. But in general, uh, if you use GIF GCN, like standard GCN for this particular problem, then mostly it will get labeled as black because most of its neighbors uh, belongs to that category. Uh, so what we want is that uh, somehow we want to uh, give more importance to its actual, like uh, true, labor, true uh, neighbors. So we want to give more importance to B and C rather than F, E, D. So for that, uh, uh, what uh, they do here is that they, along with learning the embedding for each node in the graph, uh, uh, they also uh, model this label distribution along with its confidence. So, and uh, the importance of the neighboring node is defined as inverse of this Mahanabolis distance. So what is happening over here is that um, we are also estimating some kind of label distribution for each node. And um, while deciding the importance of the neighboring node for a given target node, uh, we are using this distance formulation. So the advantage of this distance formulation is that if the confidence is low, that means uh, uh, like we are not very sure that this is the particular label of that, per, uh, of that node, then the score is always low. 
so like that node will always be given less importance but if the confidence is high then uh, if that is uh, then based on the distance we will decide the importance so if the confidence is high we are confident about the label of both the nodes then uh, if the distance is low then we will give high importance to that node otherwise we will give low importance so uh, if you use this formulation then uh, in such scenarios like we will be able to give more importance to node uh, c and b because uh, for them like we are more confident about their labels and uh, label of a and c matches whereas for nodes uh, e f and d like uh, because their label distribution is quite different so we will give low importance to those nodes and this way we will be able to solve this uh, uh, influence neighborhood uh, influence neighborhood problem so this is another solution for the same uh, for handling the same limitation so uh, now I'm going to talk about some methods uh, which allows us to learn embedding in an unsupervised manner using graph convolution networks. So uh, so this is a motivating example, like you are given this co-authorship graph, you want to detect these communities which exist in the network in an unsupervised manner. So, uh, so we all know that uh, label data is expensive. So there are like various big graphs for which uh, we have no label information. So for that, uh, these approaches are highly relevant. Like uh, one can get some representation and that can be used for several downstream tasks. Uh, so I'll be talking about these three methods. Uh, so starting with GraphSage. So GraphSage, uh, uh, they proposed three uh, kinds of aggregators. So standard GCN, we saw that it just uses the sum followed by normalization. But uh, they proposed two other variants. Like, so this is, the, uh, uh, this is the mean aggregator. So they are like, uh, uh, they take mean like uh, the neighbors and the current uh, current node and they take the union of it and took the mean. Uh, the other kind of aggregator they propose is LSTM. So they will, uh, they will they multiply all the neighbors with uh, this filter W and then instead of just summing it over, they will consider a random ordering over all the neighbors and then they will apply LSTM on it. And the final output of the uh, LSTM will be taken as the embedding for that current node. So this is another kind of aggregator and they have shown that it's uh, a uh, bit superior to the mean aggregator. And uh, another one they propose is pooling. So instead of doing the sum, you can do simple max, max pool over it. And that will also give us a representation of the current node. So that is also another kind of aggregator. So the unsupervised thing in their method is that uh, they uh, generalize this word to vec for this graph structure. So this is their objective function. So it's very similar to a word to vec objective. So this is the uh, so in the first term, uh, they are go uh, by this first term, they are basically um, bringing the embedding of nearby nodes together. So ZU and Z, uh, ZV are like the embedding of the node, which are uh, neighbor of each other. And they, they, are, they want to uh, minimize this thing and basically trying to bring their embeddings together. And uh, they s for a given node, they s randomly sample some uh, nodes which are not in its neighborhood. And uh, for them, they, they are taking their embeddings far apart. So if we just uh, take this simple objective and uh, train the embeddings, uh, then uh, we learn some representation for each node. And uh, that can be used for several downstream tasks. So that's their basic approach. Another work in this line is uh, graph autoencoder. So uh, we all are familiar with variational autoencoder. So, uh, so basically, there the, we have some input x. We use an encoder. And um, then uh, we learn some Gaussian distribution. From that, we sample some z. And uh, that is passed to a decoder. And then we try to reconstruct x back. So that is a uh, simple pipeline with variational autoencoder. So in, if we are working in the domain of graphs, then we, along with uh, the input features, we also have this adjacency matrix. So, so both will be passed to an encoder. Uh, and uh, uh, so. Encoder is basically here a GCN because it can make use of both X and adjacency metrics. And uh, that will give us some, uh, using that we will learn some Gaussian distribution, mu and sigma. And uh, from that Gaussian distribution, we will sample some Z. And that will be passed to a decoder. And instead of reconstructing X, we will try to reconstruct the adjacency metrics back again. So that is a little bit of difference here. So the reconstruction loss is basically computed uh, between uh, A and A cap. So that there is a small difference. And uh, the second thing is like reducing the KL divergence between uh, the learned distribution and the normal normal distribution. So standard normal distribution. So that's the, uh, I think, the common thing. So this is another way of uh, uh, learning this uh, 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 like embeddings for node in an unsupervised manner. 
So this, uh, so, uh, this deep graph informax has, was proposed last year. So this is currently the state of the art for learning this uh, graph embeddings in an unsupervised way. So here the idea is uh, you have a graph. So graph is basically input features and adjacency metrics. So what we will do is that we will take a corruption function and uh, we'll construct a, a corrupted graph, which will be represented with A tilde and X tilde. So what they do is that they just randomly shuffle the uh, rows of A and for corrupting X, and for A also they do similar sort of thing. They just randomly shuffle the rows of this. So they get this corrupted graph. Now over both the graphs, we will apply graph convolution network. So this will give us uh, this H, uh, like this, which is basically a matrix. Uh, so it contains the representation for all the nodes in the graph, which is H1, H2, Hn. And uh, we will also apply a other uh, separate GCN model for on this corrupted graph, and that will give us this uh, representation for each node in the corrupted graph. Now the idea is very simple. Uh, so they define this readout function, which is simply a mean of uh, embeddings of all the nodes in the correct graph followed by some sigmoid. So that will give them this S vector. And uh, this S vector is, uh, it represents, uh, it contains the global properties of the entire graph. So, uh, so the pr problem here becomes that we want to maximize the mutual information between, uh, 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 the, between S and D, uh, which, which is the output of this thing. And we want to take it apart from D. So basically, they compute this uh, Jensen Shannon's divergence between S and uh, uh, the embeddings of this, and they want to reduce that, and they want to increase the JS divergence between the corrupted graph and S. So using this uh, simple objective, they learn some kind of representation uh, for all the nodes in the graph. So this is another way of uh, embedding a graph in an unsupervised manner. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about some graph pooling techniques. So till now we have been working on um, uh, on node level, but uh, in some scenarios uh, we might want to predict uh, in, on the graph level. So like we want to predict for the whole graph, like classify the whole graph. So in this case, like uh, we want to classify this entire subgraph into some category. So there we, uh, these uh, node level techniques won't work. So that's why we need these pooling techniques. So another application in NLP can be like we are given this graph and uh, we want to classify this whole document. So, uh, so how to do that? So basically, uh, the node level techniques, we cannot apply directly. So we need some mechanism for uh, converting the whole graph into a single embedding that we can pass to a classifier and that can uh, be used for final prediction. Uh, so the uh, inspiration for this is coming from CNNs as well. So in CNNs, we have an image and we apply multiple layers of CNN to get a single representation for the entire uh, entire image. So we can see that like uh, multiple layers of CNN are being applied. So in the case of graph, we want something similar. So we have a big graph. We'll apply a GCN layer on it, and that should give us a smaller graph. And then again, we'll apply a GCN layer, and that will give us even smaller graph. And that way, we will uh, just boil down to a single embedding, and that we can use for our downstream task. Uh, but the problem in the case of uh, graphs is that uh, the clustering is NP-hard. So there is no standard way like how you can uh, do this kind of uh, uh, like clubbing of nodes. So one has to work with some approximations. So, so there has been like several approximations for this. So the first uh, will be like uh, you use simple max or moon, uh, mean pooling. So this uh, is like heavily utilized by works. But uh, as you can see, like uh, it ignores a lot of other information which is there in the graph. So like, uh, like mean over all the nodes and max over all the nodes, that's not the best way. So other methods involves uh, using this something called Grecler's clustering algorithm and uh, this set to set and diff pool. So I'm going to talk about all them, all of them. Yeah, so uh, so uh, first I'm going to talk about this uh, Grecler's clustering algorithm. So it is based on this uh, uh, spectral clustering objective. So in spectral clustering, the goal is uh, we are given a graph and we want to split the graph such that uh, this objective is minimized. So basically we want to make these cuts such that uh, their weight is minimum, and uh, we also want to maximize the volume of the clusters. So the volume is defined just as the sum of the degrees, and cut is defined as like the weight of the edges which we are removing. So equivalent to normalized cut is normalized association. So uh, one can show that these both objectives are similar, uh, almost equivalent. And uh, so instead, uh, instead of like cutting here, we are want we want to increase the association between a given clusters. So. Uh, so both objectives are uh, identical. Uh, so 
so the Grackler's clustering algorithm is focused on uh, maximizing this uh, first objective, which is of normalized association. So the algorithm uh, is a greedy algorithm. Uh, so it works quite uh, fast in practice, and it can be parallelized as well. So, so the basic idea here is that at each layer of uh, our GCN model, we will, uh, in a greedy fashion, we will decide like which two nodes should be merged. So in this particular case, uh, uh, like uh, based on this, uh, for locally uh, maximizing this uh, normalized association, uh, I think it should be maximized. Yeah. So uh, we will select, we will match two nodes, uh, like a pair of nodes, and uh, once we have this matching, we can uh, m merge both the nodes in a single node. So. Uh, so that's their uh, algorithm, like it's two step. First we do this vertex matching. So there we like find these pairs of vertices and then it, uh, we perform this graph coarsening where we merge these two nodes into a single node and uh, define a new adjacency matrix, which is uh, given by this formulation. So basically like uh, we will sum all the edges with which uh, it is connected, the weights of the edges with which the, it is connected to the other uh, new clusters. So it's very simple and uh, it's uh, quite fast in practice as well. The other method is uh, called set to set. So the method has uh, three components, but uh, for this uh, uh, pooling part, we just need the initial two. So the basic idea here is that uh, uh, we, we, are given a, uh, we are given a graph, so we will first randomly assign some kind of ordering over all the vertices. So, uh, uh, so uh, some random ordering will be decided and uh, we will take some uh, random state uh, which we will denote with Q0. So their method has this uh, read part and process part. So read part is very simple. It's just a fully connected network which takes in the initial, uh, which takes in the embedding of the nodes and uh, performs some like uh, uh, fully connected opera operation on it, like uh, uh, multi-layer perceptron, and gives us something called as memory unit. So it's also an embedding. Uh, so uh, the main thing happens in the process process block. So here uh, we have this initial state Q0, and that we pass to an LSTM, and that gives us. Uh, so if we pass it Q0, then it will give us Q1. Then uh, the next step involves computing some kind of attention score over all the nodes. So uh, by this formulation, they uh, get some uh, scalars for all the nodes in the graph. And uh, using that attention score, they will get a representation for the entire graph. And that they will concatenate with the output of LSTM and then again pass it to the LSTM. So this is done uh, t times. So, uh, so the basic motivation behind doing all this is that uh, whatever initial ordering we assumed over the vertices, if we perform this this operation t times, that uh, initial ordering becomes uh, uh, like it becomes irrelevant on the uh, for the final output. So even if like we assumed another ordering, they have shown that uh, the final output almost remains the same because we perform this operation, which makes the uh, model to forget the what was the initial ordering uh, which we assumed. So this way, uh, and the final uh, representation which we get from the LSTM, that is taken as the representation for the entire graph, and that is passed to the final classification uh, um, layer, and then uh, we can do whatever we want, like uh, predict the uh, some class or like do regression or something like that. So that's the set to set model. Uh, so uh, so in uh, NeurIPS 2018, uh, this diff pool was proposed. So here uh, the idea is same, like we are given a graph and we want to map it to a smaller graph. So uh, the difference of this, uh, between this method and the other earlier proposed method is that here everything is uh, differentiable and uh, like everything is learned uh, in an end-to-end -end fashion. So their basic idea is that uh, they learn this soft clustering assignment matrix, so which is learned for each uh, layer in the, uh, in the GCN layer. So uh, so the, uh, the the purpose of this uh, uh, soft soft clustering matrix is that it will map uh, this bigger graph to a smaller graph based on this formulation. So it's quite simple. So this uh, this soft clustering uh, matrix is computed based on this uh, uh, like uh, using another GCN formulation and uh, the input features and the new adjacency matrix for the next layer is computed in this fashion. So it's very very simple. Like you just take the adjacency matrix of the previous layer and multiply it with S and S transpose on both sides, and that will give you a new adjacency matrix for the next layer. And the uh, similar sort of thing is done for input features as well. So this way you'll get the uh, new graph
for the next layer and uh, they take this soft clustering matrix in such a fashion that the size of the graph reduces at every step. So basically in their case like they take 25% uh, smaller. So like if you have 100 nodes over here then this will have 25 nodes so like that. Uh, so that's a uh, hyper parameter and uh, uh, that way like they map this bigger graph to a single vector. And uh, since this S uh, is like parameterized by this model so uh, and this is also uh, part of the whole network so everything is learned end to end. So this is their whole method, like it takes in the input graph, uh, A and its features, and it gives back uh, another graph, which is like a smaller graph, which is A and X L plus one. So it has been shown that uh, the clustering, which the diff pool performs, is actually interpretable. So all the clusters, they have some meaning, like it's not all random. And uh, compared to all the techniques we discussed, uh, it gives uh, some, ga uh, some gain in the performance as well. Yeah, so now I'm going to talk about uh, the last part of this section. Yeah, if someone has any questions, then uh, we'll be happy to take. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, okay, I'll then continue. Sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, in this section, uh, I'll be covering the theory behind the GNN. So in the uh, overview section we directly showed you the equation of GNN uh, without giving any uh, like theory behind it like how we came with that equation but here uh, uh, we'll try to get some idea like how is it's drive in, uh, how it's drive and how it's actually like uh, like what's the basis of that yeah uh, so there is some uh, notation for uh, uh, for this section so we'll assume that we are working with undirected connected graph and uh, it's also weighted, so uh, the vertices are represented with V, edge, uh, edge list with E, and uh, the adjacency matrix will be weighted adjacency matrix, and it will be represented with W. Uh, so the first thing uh, is uh, which uh, we need to understand for understanding this section is graph signal. So just like in standard uh, things, we have function which maps uh, domain to its range. So here we have something called as graph signal. So it's a it's a function which maps vertices to a scalar. So basically this can be understood from this example. So here like we have a graph. So this function is assigning some value to each uh, vertex in the graph. So basically a scalar on it. So that is represented through these lines. So smaller values represent smaller lines. So that's the, uh, that's the graph signal. So you can represent the whole thing as a vector. So, it, uh, so if there are like n vertices, capital N vertices in the graph, then it will become a uh, n-dimensional vector. And uh, if we assume some kind of ordering over all the vertices, so here in this case like v1, v2, v3, so we can assume this whole graph signal as a vector, and this is represented with this bold f. And here it's uh, ith entry corresponds to the ith vertex in the graph. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, in the Euclidean space, uh, we define a convolution operation between two functions uh, by this formulation. So uh, it's like an integral over x and x minus x dash. So, so the properties over there uh, which is most relevant for us is uh, this convolution theorem. So basically if you want to perform convolution between two functions, then there is another way like instead of doing this uh, integral, you can compute graph, uh, you can compute Fourier transform of f and Fourier transform of g and gen can just take a simple dot product and then can take inverse Fourier transform. So using this uh, simple technique, like uh, we can avoid this and uh, we can get the uh, convolution between the two functions. So uh, so this figure is from the image domain. So, so there like we have some image. So we take its Fourier transform, which uh, somewhat looks like this. And uh, <coughs> then uh, in the Fourier domain, we multiply with some filter W like with some filter and so here like uh, it's like a low pass filter and uh, then we transform the image uh, back into uh, its spatial domain using inverse Fourier transform and that gives us the final image. So the GCNs are also uh, motivated by a uh, similar sort of approach. So in GCNs, uh, so here everything is defined by analogy. So like there is no uh, theory behind like how can we directly apply it to graph. So 
uh, things in graphs are defined by analogy. So here, uh, we instead of two functions, we have two graph signals. And uh, we want to perform convolution operation between them. So what we will do is that uh, instead of taking Fourier transform, we will take something called as graph Fourier transform of both of them, multiply them, and then take the graph inverse Fourier transform. So this will be our approach uh, in the graph domain. And that's how uh, convolution operation is uh, generalized uh, uh, for non euclidean in space, uh, which includes like graphs. So, uh, and the main uh, uh, player will be here is uh, our graph spectral theory. So this will allow us to define the graph Fourier transform and its inverse Fourier transform. So we need to um, know something about this graph Fourier, uh, graph spectral graph theory as well. Uh, so in the spectral graph theory, uh, the most important thing is graph Laplacian. So uh, for a for a uh, graph signal, it is simply defined as like uh, you look at its uh, value of the current vertex and subtract it with its neighboring vertex value, uh, multiply it with the uh, the edge weight. So if you'll do it for all the neighbors, then that gives us the graph Laplacian value for that particular vertex. So uh, so whole thing can be represented by a matrix. So this is called as Laplacian matrix, and so it it can be just given as d minus w where D is the degree matrix and uh, this involves just uh, summing uh, the rows of W. So it's quite simple. So the good thing about this Laplacian matrix is that it is positive semi-definite. So uh, that means it has complete set of orthonormal eigenvectors and uh, all its eigenvalues are non-negative. So one can uh, do the spectral decomposition of this graph Laplacian and it can give us this formulation. So, uh, so the graph Fourier transform uh, is... Uh, uh, simply defined as uh, like you have some graph signal. So here it's represented as a vector, uh, which we talked about earlier. So you just uh, take this uh, matrix phi. So uh, so phi is basically uh, it, it it is a complete set of eigenvectors of this Laplacian matrix. So all of all of its uh, column will be uh, eigenvect eigenvectors. So you just uh, multiply the original signal with this, and that will give you give you the Fourier trans graph Fourier transform. And uh, if you multiply with this phi directly of the transformed uh, signal, then uh, you will get the get back the original signal. So that's how uh, the graph Fourier transform and inverse graph Fourier transform are defined in the graph domain. So it's very simple. Uh, so uh, what has uh, what has been shown is that uh, this uh, the eigenvalues of the graph Laplacian uh, they behave very similar to the uh, frequency in the Euclidean space. So uh, so if we define something uh, called as uh, this uh, cross zero edges, so uh, so so one so eigenvalues are actually a graph signal. Like each eigenvalue is a graph signal. So if we look at the uh, eigenvector. Uh, sorry, eigenvector is a graph signal. So if we look at the eigenvector corresponding to the smallest eigenvalue, then uh, it looks something like this. So, uh, and if we look at the eigenvalue cor uh, corresponding to a larger eigenvalue, uh, then it looks something like this. So uh, what has been shown is that uh, if we measure this uh, cross zero edges, which is simply like you, uh, you look at all the edges and uh, you count those edges, where the function value has got inverted. So basically, fi into fj is less than zero. So that means, uh, like the both the uh, vertices, neighboring vertices has like uh, some one has positive and other has negative value. So if this is negative, then those edge, uh, those edges we are counting over here. So if we count uh, such edges in the eigenvector corresponding to smaller eigenvalue, then uh, this uh, turns out to be much lower. And as we increase the eigenvalue then the corresponding eigenvector has more of such, uh, like the count of uh, this set increases. So basically what is happening is that uh, uh, with the increase in eigenvalue, the graph signal is becoming uh, more noisy. So so by, uh, so like it's not, it's tending more away from the smooth uh, signal. So by smooth, I mean like uh, the connected vertices should have similar, similar function value. Like it should have similar value. So here we can see that these two vertices are connected and they have very similar value. But if we look at the eigenvector corresponding to high, higher eigenvalue, then uh, this is not the case. So even though these two are connected, but they have very different value. So the eigenvector corresponding to higher eigenvalue will be uh, like more rough, like it will uh, it will not be smooth. So that's what uh, has been observed, and uh, you can understand this uh, uh, theoretically as well. So this is the measure of uh, roughness uh, 
on uh, for the graphs. So this is the vector and this is the Laplacian matrix. Uh, so if we minimize it for uh, for the entire space, then we get the first eigen vector. And uh, if we constrain our uh, space such that uh, the first eigen vector is not included, then we'll get the second eigen vector and so on. So we can see that the eigen vector is the smoothest, like the smallest eigen vector is the smoothest signal which we can get for that graph. And as we are increasing the eigen value, then that uh, ve uh, vector becomes uh, more and more non-smooth. Yeah. So that's it. So uh, that was, I think, the toughest part. So now, uh, once we have that. Uh, we can uh, define uh, this uh, convolution operation on graph space. So uh, it can be defined like this. So, uh, so basically, the, uh, so we are given some uh, two graph signals. So we'll perform their uh, graph Fourier transform by multiplying with these mat matrices. And uh, we'll mul take their dot product and then take the inverse. So this whole thing can be uh, through some algebra. It can be reduced to this form. So basically, it has boiled down to you take the graph signal and multiply with some function uh, which is a with some g which uh, which is a function of laplacian so that's how the whole thing has boiled down to through some algebra so so th this has become our uh, like the convolution operation over graphs uh, the problem with that uh, uh, with this formulation is that uh, since g is a function of uh, uh, the eigen values and eigen vector it's very expensive to compute so it cannot be directly used in practice so what people have come up with uh, that is that uh, they define this uh, uh, g cap uh, delta as a polynomial function and uh, they use uh, this chebyshev polynomial for this so that sig significantly uh, reduces the computational complexity and uh, uh, this is how uh, uh, the formulation is defined so uh, so this whole thing uh, the gcn for this graph uh, for this graph f like it has boiled down to this equation so here theta k uh, are parameters of the model and uh, tk is the kth order chebyshev polynomial so basically we have done some kind of approximation of the whole thing through a polynomial function and uh, uh, so this tk is defined recursively so it's uh, so t0 x is 1 t1 x is x and uh, like that you can get t2 and t3 so uh, so the whole thing is defined uh, in this fashion uh, so yeah so that's what uh, the convolution operation on graph has boiled down to and then further uh, in uh, 2016 kif gave this first order approximation of the whole thing so what they do is that they take this uh, capital k to be 1 uh, in this Chebyshev polynomial which we saw in the last slide. So uh, using that, uh, this equation boils down to this simple thing. So like theta naught and theta 1 uh, delta cap. So now what uh, th they further assume is that uh, they take lambda max equal to 2. So uh, I think I didn't focus in the last slide, but uh, this delta tilde. So instead of using delta, we have delta tilde here. And uh, that is simply like 2 delta divided by um, lambda max which is the largest eigen value so this is basically done to scale all the eigens eigen values between minus 1 to 1 uh, for uh, numerical stability so uh, in the kiss formulation they take lambda max to be 2 so that basically boils down this uh, delta tilde to uh, delta minus i n so that's what is going on over here so if you assume this lambda max to be 2 then this boils down to this thing and then we can directly substitute it over here so that gives us this for this this equation now uh, there is uh, uh, this normalized Laplacian. So graph uh, has multiple kinds of Laplacian, like normalized Laplacian, unnormalized Laplacian. So by the definition, normalized Laplacian is given by this this thing. So we can directly substitute uh, that in this equation, and that gives us this. Uh, so it's very simple. Like if you just substitute, you'll directly get this. Like I n will get cancelled by this, and this will come up. So now there is another assumption here. They uh, take uh, theta naught equal to minus of theta one reduce the number of parameters and uh, both e like equal to theta so that way like this will get replaced with theta and this will also will get replaced with theta because this will be minus theta and minus will get cancelled so theta will come out and the formulation will become this uh, so this thing uh, can be rewritten like this uh, if uh, we assume this notation so so yeah so basically <coughs> here uh, i n plus uh, d half and this we have represented through this d tilde and uh, a tilde we have defined as a as a plus a i n so using this simple uh, formulation we have get get got this simple equation for uh, convolution over graphs 
Yeah. So, uh, so the previous equation, uh, if we just uh, rename few things, then we get this formulation. So basically what we have changed here is that uh, theta has become a w. So we have renamed theta with w, uh, which is the parameter of the model. And f is x, which is the input feature of the graph. And uh, this whole thing has remained as it is. So we have got this formulation. So if we uh, represent this whole thing with a tilde, then uh, we get this formulation. Uh, which is, uh, so basically here what is happening, we have this input features and this is the GCN embedding for uh, all the nodes in the graph. <coughs> so uh, so uh, this is for the whole graph, like this will be n cross d-dimensional matrix where n is the number of vertices, but if we just focus on a single node in the graph, then this formulation can be given as this. So basically, uh, it's the equation which we saw in the overview section. So here, what's happening is that like for each node in the graph, we are looking at all its neighbors, multiplying with some filter W, and uh, finally, some normalization plus B. So this is our GCN equation, and uh, simply like it can uh, be like done for, uh, K, uh, for capturing K-hop K neighborhood, like uh, we can just use K layers of it like output of the first layer as the input to the second layer and like that. So we got the formulation which uh, we directly defined in the first slide. So uh, I just, uh, I glossed over a lot of details, but uh, this is how like the, uh, this equation comes up. So, uh, so this has be become like uh, the GCN uh, over the entire graph. Uh, so, uh, so till now we have been working with undirected graphs but uh, we, in practice we can have directed graphs as well. So, uh, so what uh, people do for directed graph is that uh, you have this graph from U to V uh, with some label LUV. So what you do is that you add an inverse H which is from V to U and the label of this uh, edge will become LUV inverse. So, uh, so then this, our, our, uh, our update equation becomes like this. So in this case, instead of keeping uh, W for all the neighbors same, we have made it label specific. And uh, uh, biases also become label specific for that particular neighbor. And uh, that's how the whole formulation has become for the directed graphs. So this is a generalization of uh, GCNs from undirected to directed graph. So this was proposed in EMLRP 2017. And uh, so their uh, work also uh, includes something called as edge gating. So instead of giving equal importance to all the nodes in the neighborhood, they will use the GCN embedding for computing some kind of scalar weight. And that also becomes part of the whole equation. And uh, that gives us the final uh, GCN update for uh, directed label graphs as well. So, uh, so now we can like apply GCNs for directed label graphs as well. Yeah, so, uh, so in ICML 2017, uh, uh, they proposed a framework called as message passing framework. So uh, the basic idea here is that uh, all the GCNs model uh, are basically can be seen as a specialization of this particular framework. So uh, what they do is that uh, they define something called as message passing function and update function. So uh, basically, uh, uh, so instead of just uh, multiplying here with W and like summing, they have defined it in a very generic fashion. So instead of multiplying with W, they have defined this function called empty, whose instance can be uh, W into something. But uh, this is like a more generic way of expressing the same thing. So here, uh, this function, which is called as message, message function, it takes in uh, the embedding of the current node, its neighboring node, and its label information. And uh, it uh, makes use of all the three things to give us back some embedding over that. Uh, uh, so this is done for all the neighbors. And then we uh, sum, uh, sum it. And uh, this gives us this MVT plus one. T here denotes the layer, layer number. So like the kth layer, which you were using earlier. And this uh, is given as uh, an input to the update function, which takes in the representation of the current node uh, with this. And that gives us the uh, GCN embedding for that present, uh, current node. So, so this is like a, a more generic way of defining all the GCNs model. And they also define something called as readout function. So this is uh, uh, our pooling operation. So, uh, so the only condition here is that R should be invariant of the order assumed over the node. So it takes in the embedding of uh, all the nodes in the graph and gives us back some function. And like R is called as the readout function. So this they uh, like keep it very abstract so, so that like most of the model fits in their case. Uh, so apart from uh, graphs in general, like uh, in real world we have something called as hypergraphs. So 
hypergraphs are like uh, uh, can be seen as like uh, an extension of graphs so they allow us to capture beyond pairwise relationship so for instance like uh, we have this co-authorship so they are like uh, <coughs> multiple authors can be part of the same paper so such kind of relationship can be expressed through hypergraphs so they look something like this so basically uh, this is an edge E3 and uh, v, V3, uh, V5 and V6, they are part of the same edge. So here the equation becomes uh, like the edge, uh, instead of be being a pair of two vertices, it has become a subset of this uh, 2 to the power V. So that's the difference. So GCNs can also be used for hypergraphs. So the basic uh, idea is that you have uh, a hyper edge, which is... Uh, uh, like there's a single hyper edge which is between multiple vertices so you apply some kind of uh, approximation to boil it down to a graph and uh, once it becomes a graph you can simply apply standard GCN equation to embed each node so it's quite simple like uh, basically you convert the hyper graph into a normal graph and then you apply uh, GCN so there can be like s several kinds of approximations for mapping this hyper graph to a normal graph so that can vary from model to model yeah, so uh, so I'll not be covering these papers in detail, but uh, I'll just list some of them. So uh, so GCNs uh, uh, for scaling GCNs to larger graphs. So the the papers which I talked about, they uh, they can handle uh, like a medium sized graph. But if you want to work with really large graphs, then there are uh, some variants of uh, GCN, which include like fast GCN, cluster GCN uh, came up recently in KDD. Uh, and there has been a lot of uh, theoretical uh, work done also uh, on this uh, understanding uh, like what is the uh, like how much powerful are these graph neural networks and uh, recently like uh, some open problems have been proposed on GNNs. Uh, so one can also go through these survey papers so they cover like a uh, list of applications of G GNNs and their variants which exist in the literature so there are uh, several of them as well so one can go through them as well. Yeah. So, uh, in, so uh, after this section, I'll be complete. Uh, I'll be covering this implementation of GCN. So we talked about like uh, how they are defined and uh, how they are used. But uh, in this section, we'll see like how you can actually use them in your code, and uh, they are actually uh, quite easy to implement. So, uh, so if you are a, a PyTorch user, then uh, <coughs> then you are a bit advantage. You are at a bit advantage uh, for using these. Uh, uh, graph neural network because uh, this library called PyTorch Geometric, so which implements the message passing framework which we talked about, so which covers almost all the graph convolution networks. Uh, and like this uh, library has uh, implementation of several recent papers, and the uh, code base is also quite easy to understand. Uh, another option is uh, to use uh, this graph uh, deep graph library. So the so advantage here is that it works with uh, MXNet and Glucon. Uh, Gluon and uh, uh, PyTorch is also supported and uh, so it allows batching of computation and they have shown that uh, it's uh, more scalable to large graphs compared to PyTorch geometric so uh, like if you are working with really large graphs then I think the DCL will be a better option. So uh, if you are a TensorFlow user uh, then uh, <coughs> there is a library from DeepMind uh, which is called GraphNets library. So, uh, so it, uh, as of now, it doesn't have uh, implementation of recent papers, uh, but just a like, uh, basic implementation of PyTorch geometric for uh, TensorFlow. And uh, recently, uh, uh, there is another library from Google, uh, which is called Neural Structured Learning. So it's currently uh, in its very uh, initial stages. So the basic idea here is to provide uh, Keras-like API for GCN architecture, and uh, uh, also to construct the graph uh, from the training data on the go. Uh, so uh, in our tutorial, we are uh, also providing some uh, initial beginning code uh, for implementing GCNs uh, in both the languages. So I'll just go through uh, that in brief. So we we are providing something called as uh, this TF GCN, so which is a very simplified implementation of uh, first order approximation of GCN, which was proposed by KIF. Uh, this is for TensorFlow, and uh, we also provide equivalent impl implementation uh, for PyTorch uh, using PyTorch geometric. And uh, uh, this link uh, contains the list of all the recent papers which are published uh, uh, in G GNN, uh, in GNN area. So uh, I'll go through the code uh, very quickly. So this is, the entire code is in TensorFlow. So 
so basically the uh, uh, so idea here is to uh, uh, make you convince that uh, GNNs are not that difficult to implement in practice. So that's why like I'm going through the code. Uh, so this uh, this is a GCN layer. So this takes in uh, the input uh, features of the nodes. It takes in the adjacency matrix, uh, the input dimension, the output dimension of the GCN, and uh, what activation function you want, some dropout, and uh, these are some like uh, helping helping variables. So so the first part of the function, uh, it just defines uh, this W and bias, which are part of the standard GCN equation. So it's quite simple thing, like we define some variable scope and uh, W and B, and some L2 regularization over that. Uh, and then in this part, we are just multiplying uh, this W with uh, all the feature nodes. So this basically uh, boils down to just multiplying W and this feature matrix, uh, basically GCN in and adjacent uh, and this uh, W which we have defined. So just uh, applying some dropout and then taking GCN product of GCN in and weights. So that gives us this thing. And then to perform uh, this summation, uh, we don't have to apply any for loop or anything. We just need to multiply this adjacency matrix with uh, the output of this previous uh, module. So uh, pre-sub with multiply with adjacency matrix that gives us uh, the output of this whole summation for each uh, node in the graph. And uh, with that, we have also added the bias. So this uh, simple uh, code uh, is actually the one layer of GCN. So you can stack multiple of them to. Uh, to implement a K layer and something like that. And finally, we apply some activation at the end. So that's it. Uh, so we also provide an equivalent imp implementation in PyTorch. So in PyTorch Geometric, uh, uh, it provides something called as GCN Con. So it takes in uh, the input features and the output dimension. And uh, in this forward step, you can uh, just pass the input features along with the adjacency matrix in this uh, edge list format and it will give you back the GCN output and that you can use for downstream applications. So uh, I provided Colab as well, so you can just click and run it. Uh, so you can see this running. Uh, uh, one can see uh, this uh, PyTorch geometric version as well on the GitHub. Yeah, so uh, so in NLP, uh, uh, like uh, rather than having a big large graph, uh, we have multiple small graphs as in the input. So to uh, for dealing with that, like uh, uh, I've included that slide, uh, this slide. So uh, suppose like we are dealing with uh, text classification problem. So there the graph will not be common for all the sentences in the graph. So each sentence will have a different graph. So uh, in those scenarios, it becomes a little bit of uh, it becomes a problem like how one can do batching. So so there the basic idea is that uh, uh, we construct this. Uh, a big adjacency matrix, which is actually a block diagonal matrix. So suppose if our batch has three sentences, so what we will do is that we will construct this adjacency matrix where uh, each block will have the uh, adjacency matrix of uh, one element in the batch. So the first element corresponding to the first sentence in the batch, we will have this graph. And then uh, corresponding second element, we will have B2 and B3. And whole thing we will arrange as uh, in the block diagonal fashion so that they don't, uh, like the information doesn't get mixed up between uh, different graphs because all the instances are separate. So, and uh, the node features, they, they will be just become the concatenation of the, uh, the f uh, features of uh, each graph. So you just need to concatenate uh, the features corresponding to the first element of the batch and second and third. So once we have this, X and this big uh, adjacency matrix, we can apply the standard GCN formulation uh, to get the GC, uh, updated uh, GCN embedding, which is which will be H. And once we have H, then we can again split it into H1, H2, H3, and then use it for the downstream task. So this is how uh, it's actually done in practice, uh, speci especially in the case of NLP, where uh, each instance of the batch uh, has a different graph in itself. So this is how it is done in practice. Yeah. Uh, so if anyone has uh, any questions, then uh, then please, uh, yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, this one? Yeah. Uh, it's not audible. So why do you need this large matrix here? Your convolution formula is local, right? So each 
like um, each node you just take convolution of its neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. And if you, your sentence is a separate small graph, then you actually don't need other sentences. You just need this sentence graph to compute the convolution. And why do you need to stack them like this? Uh, so, so basically, uh, batching is mainly done for parallelization. So, uh, suppose like in our batch, like there are uh, three sentences. So, th all the three sentences are not related to each other. Like we have to deal them independently. Right, and that's yeah. why you don't need this large matrix, essentially. Yes, yes, you just yes. can parallelize automatically because each sentence is a separate small graph, right? Uh, yeah, so actually in practice we don't create this big matrix. Like we store it in its pass format. So, yeah, but the uh, whole thing is arranged uh, in this fashion so that uh, uh, we can apply the GCN formulation which we looked at earlier. Because uh, we cannot apply a loop here. Like that will be very slow. Like dealing, uh, so we cannot like deal, uh, apply GCN for one graph, or, uh, like one element of the graph in the batch and then second, that will be very slow. So to okay. deal with all of them in parallel, we construct this big matrix and apply GCN at once, and that gives us the GCN update, uh, okay. update okay. embedding for the whole, all the batches. Other questions? No? Okay. So, uh, Shikhar, if you could go to slide number 76. 76. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Shikhar covered a lot of methods, uh, but if you want to take anything uh, home from this section, I would say that you should become comfortable uh, with this slide and the equations that's here, right? So, first of all, as we kind of like, you know, went through all of that math and spectral graph theory, uh, while the general uh, formulation is there through, but through making these kind of like first order approximations, uh, we end up with some uh, update equation like this, right? So which is the first order Kipps model for GCN, right? So this is defining uh, an uh, individual node basis, how we can refine its embeddings uh, based on the embeddings of its neighbors. And this is nothing but uh, this equation, uh, while this is defined on the whole graph level, uh, this is defined at a, on a single node level. Right? These two actually are equivalent. and. Uh, What's really, I mean, like, you know, you should kind of like, when you think about this first order GCN models, you should just think of them as like this AXW and then some uh, nonlinearity defined on top of that. So if you want to now uh, uh, define layers of these GCNs, right? So you are doing nothing but stacking of these, right? So you say you define this one as H and then you define another layer called like you know, F. Uh, a tilde HW. So that's kind of like you know, applying another F uh, on top of like you know, multiplying A tilde on the left and W on the right. So, so that way, by defining in a recursive manner, you can define like you know, additional layers of GC and on top of that. And each such layer, uh, because each such application is defining just one hop neighborhood of that application of application of the filter, and by defining those additional recursive layers, you are defining uh, like you know, more number of hops from that target node that you're interested in. Like, you know, one hop, two hop, that like, you know, you're increasing the uh, neighborhood size uh, over which you're applying those filters, right? So that basically is, uh, like, you know, even though we covered lots of methods, uh, this is the most popular uh, form of GCN, which we also call as the KIF GCN, which is the first order approximation. And then you could also do, like, you know, more number of layers on top of that, right? So uh, in the next section, uh, Naganan will cover uh, lots of methods, uh, but all of those methods are going to primarily utilize this like you know, vanilla uh, KIFS model, right? So as an uh, opportunity, as you could see, there are like you know, lots of methods that have been defined uh, for GCNs, but not many of them uh, have been applied for NLP problems. So that's a great uh, opportunity for further research to bring those, uh, uh, to apply all of those additional methods. So uh, this is, uh, I just want to highlight that this is an important slide and hopefully you uh, got a sense of the, uh, the nature of these equations and that these two are actually say, uh, same and uh, these are just like the you know, first order approximations of the full uh, model. So uh, any questions uh, so far? No? Okay, so we'll take a break now of 30 minutes. So we'll uh, assemble here again at uh, 3.50. And uh, so math is over, by the way. <laughs> <laughs>
right? So next we are just going to look at applications of uh, uh, primarily these models and some of subset of these models that we have covered uh, for a variety of NLP applications. So we'll still be around here. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to come up and uh, chat with us. Uh, we'll see you again at uh, 3.50. Thank you.